And I wanna take you to the New Testament in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. I'm gonna read the same verse four times in four different translations because I want it to, to paint a picture of where I feel like God has us going today as we end this Ask, Seek, Pray series. Here's what it says in verse 17 of 1 Thessalonians 5 in the New Living Translation. Never stop praying. Come on, y'all shout never. never. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 in the NIV. Pray continually. The Message Translation says it like this. Pray all the time. The King James Version. Pray without ceasing. There's, there's a lot happening there, and I wanna talk to you today about prayer. More specifically, I wanna have a conversation about how in the world we're supposed to do that. Because you probably all picked up what the God's word is throwing down and what the gospel says here. I mean, never stop praying, pray continually, pray all the time, pray without ceasing. How in the world are we supposed to do that? Does anybody feel like they're failing already as a follower of Jesus when you read that scripture? I'll raise both my hands. It just seems impossible. And I wanna tell you, a story that will kind of help us get where I think God has us going today. Little, little bit about my background. I grew up as a pastor's kid. My mom and dad faithfully pastored a church, the same church in the middle of a cornfield in Kingston, Ohio for over 30 years at the same church with the same people committed to what God had called them to do. And so as a pastor's kid, I was in church all the time, even when there was nobody else in church. Like if there was anything going on, even if it was a meeting that only five people knew about, me and my family were at church. And I, I loved that. I mean, I, I just grew up with a massive heart for the church. Despite all of its flaws and all of its imperfection, I still believe and always have believed that the church is the hope of the world. Somebody say amen. It's actually more beautiful because it's not perfect and we don't have it all figured out. We're all messy, imperfect people. And so I loved the church and I had a heart for the people in the church. And I loved going to Sunday school as a kid. And I didn't just love going to Sunday school as a kid. Y'all, I loved wearing my Sunday best. I mean, I love the, the tie, I love the blazer, I love the pants. I had some cowboy boots on in that picture that was taken at the portrait studio inside a Sears store. Y'all remember Sears, don't you? I mean, they are no more. Some of y'all forgot they had a portrait studio up in that joint though, and they did. And it's where we got our, our family pictures taken. And I was so proud of that suit. I wanted to wear it every single week, my Sunday best. I just came into church looking like I was ready to go to church. Cause when I was growing up, that's how you dress to go to church. And I had no problem putting on that that tie and that shirt and that jacket and I had to have those cowboy boots. Just had to have those cowboy boots. And I would go to Sunday school and I love Sunday school. And yes, I love Sunday school because we learn more about Jesus, but I also love Sunday school because they had some good snacks up in there. I mean, I love the apple juice they had and then my favorite snack was they had potato sticks. And if you don't know what potato sticks are, let, let, me, let me help you understand one of the best snacks ever invented that we always had in Sunday school. A potato stick is what would happen if you took a McDonald's french fry and a classic Lay's potato chip and they had a baby. Come on, somebody. That's what you call comfort snacks right there. They were thin, crispy, chip fries, didn't know what they wanted to be. I just knew they were good and I could eat my weight in those potato sticks. So I loved learning about Jesus and I loved the snacks that came with Sunday school. And I showed up every week hungry for the snacks and hungry for the word. And I, I had a teacher that I loved dearly. She helped me learn so much about following Jesus. One day she taught on this text gave us a whole message on this, on this text right here, that verse that I just read to you in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. I really felt like God took me back to this verse when I was getting ready to preach this to y'all. I just couldn't get away from it. And I couldn't forget what she told us when she taught us from this verse. She meant well, I know she did. But she talked about this whole praying without ceasing thing. 
And she told us that we needed to pray without ceasing and that one of the reasons we needed to be praying all the time is because we're all sinners in need of a savior. Y'all can say amen to that. I'm a sinner, you're a sinner, we're all sinners, right? We've got that in common today. And I knew that, I was tracking with her when she said that, but she said, hey, there's heaven and there's hell and you gotta repent of your sins and ask forgiveness for your sins if you wanna go to heaven. And that's where she probably should have stopped, but she didn't stop there. She said, some of us mess up and make mistakes and we sin in our daily life and we don't even know it. And so one of the reasons that God wants us to pray without ceasing is so that if something happens to us, we make sure our heart's right and we get to spend eternity in heaven with Jesus instead of in hell away from Jesus. I'm nine years old. I had nightmares about that for a month, somebody. I didn't know that's not what the scripture was talking about. And I know she didn't mean to scare us, but she terrified us. And so I started thinking, man, I probably am sinning all the time and don't even know it. I just must be sinning every minute of every day. So what did I do? I just started to pray as much as I could all the time under my breath. I mean, I'm brushing my teeth. I'm praying. I'm going to bed. I'm praying. I'm waking up. I'm praying. I'm playing center field on my little league baseball team. I'm praying. I'm playing Super Mario Brothers on my Super Nintendo, I'm praying. And then I was around that age where I was starting to get a little interested in girls and y'all better know I was praying about that. <laughs> so I'm just praying, God forgive me of my sins, God forgive me of my sins, I wanna be in heaven with you, forgive me of my sins. I don't even know if I'm sinning, but God forgive me of my sins, forgive me of my sins, forgive me of my sins. I was terrified. And I just felt like I couldn't keep up. I felt like there was this unrealistic expectation that I was supposed to pray all the time just so I could ask forgiveness for my sins and make sure that I was in heaven with Jesus instead of in hell without him, because nobody wants that. When we read 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, it's kind of like it seems, but, but it's not exactly like it seems. In, in the message translation, this scripture falls below this header that says the way he wants you to live. Paul's writing this letter to the church in Thessalonica. And when the message translation puts that, what they want us to lean into is that this is how Paul is telling the church Jesus wants them to live. Jesus wants you to follow him in this way. So he gives this big audacious thought of never stop praying, pray continually, pray all the time, pray without ceasing. And we think, man, what are we supposed to do with that? So sometimes I have these moments where I'm reading God's word, I'm studying something, and, and I, just, I just decide, man, maybe that means something different than I think it means. Maybe if something's been translated throughout the years from, from Greek to our English language, maybe they missed something in translation. So I kind of wanted that to be the case, little pastor secret, sometimes we want the, the text to mean something that it doesn't say, because we really don't want it to mean what it says. And so I looked it up in the Greek, and it's this, this Greek word, this phrase without ceasing is not a phrase in the Greek, it's just a word. And this word is adi alistos, adi alistos. And here's what it means. I looked it up for you so you don't have to. It means without omission or uninterrupted. In other words, it means exactly what it says it means. It, it means that we're not supposed to interrupt it. It means we're supposed to pray without ceasing. We're supposed to pray continually. We're supposed to never stop praying. And so that definition makes it sound like it's exactly what it seems. But we know it's impossible to do that, don't we? I mean, how in the world am I supposed to pray all the time? How am I supposed to never stop talking to Jesus? I want you to think about something. For as unique and diverse as we all are this morning in this room and everybody watching online, we're all unique, right? Different ages, stages, races, political affiliations, socioeconomic backgrounds, right? All these different things. And yet there, there is something that we all share in common and that we, each of us do every day we're on this earth and that's breathing. I mean, all of us right now have breath in our lungs because we're, we're still here. We've still been gifted with this thing called life. And when we wake up, we're breathing. And when we go to sleep, we're breathing. When we woke up this morning, we were breathing. And God willing, we'll be breathing when we go to sleep tonight and wake up again to do it all over the next day. We breathe 
so much that even though we're grateful for it, sometimes we forget it's happening. I mean, it's just who we are. It's just how God created us. It's just what we do. And yet we are breathing all the time. Every day of the week that we're still here, we have breath in our lungs. And so the only thing any of us do without ceasing while we're living is we're breathing. And that's the point. Because Paul is talking about a lifestyle that is so rooted in Christ that prayer is as close to our lips as our next breath. Prayer is as close as breathing. That's what Paul's talking about, being so in tune with God, being so in tune with the Spirit that we pray without ceasing. He's really echoing another thought from King David in Psalm 34, 1, where King David says, God, may your praise ever be on my lips. Now, David ain't walking around singing Elevation Worship in Mav City all the time. That's not what he's talking about. He can't do that, even though he liked music and would probably want to do that. What he's saying is, God, may my life be a song of praise to you. May my very breath be a song of praise to you. May I remember that you created me and that you sustained me and that I have everything that I have and that I am who I am because of you. Prayer is our direct connection to the heart of God, and it's, it's a key to growing deep roots in our faith. And so here we are as a church at the end of our 21 days of prayer and fasting. And all of us have a choice to make, a decision to make, something that we have to decide whether or not we're gonna do. And here it is. We have to decide whether prayer is going to be a seasonal activity that we do every 21 days, twice a year, and every Sunday morning, or whether or not it's going to be a lifestyle for us as long as we're still here with breath in our lungs. And sometimes in church, God shows up, he transforms us, he changes us from the inside out, and it's an amazing season. But he doesn't want it to be a season, he wants that season to propel us to a new lifestyle. Prayer is not just a spiritual activity, it's a lifestyle that God wants each and every single one of us to develop. So practically speaking, I wanna give you just a few thoughts today on how to pray, when to pray, and what to pray. I really believe that most Christians don't prioritize prayer because they don't know how to pray. And you should be grateful for a church and a pastor and staff and leaders that equip you and teach you how to pray. I mean, at the very beginning of this 21 days, y'all had access to this, this prayer guide and it tells you how to pray. It literally walks you through what that looks like. Thank God for a church that's teaching people to pray because some of us have been following Jesus for years and yet we've never really learned how to pray. In Mark 135, it says, before daybreak the next morning, Jesus got up and he went to an isolated place to pray. This is important. Jesus did this more than once. There are multiple scriptures in the New Testament where Jesus retreats to pray. As a matter of fact, there are two things Jesus did very consistently during his earthly ministry that we probably don't talk about enough because we love the healings and we love the teaching and the preaching and we should love all of those things. But Jesus always did two things over and over and over again. He would retreat to rest and he would retreat to pray. Why did he rest? Because you can't pour out if you're not filled up. And so as much as he was called to pour out, he had to fill up. Somebody came here just to hear that word for your life today because you're trying to do all the things for all the people and you wanna pour out, but you're not taking time to fill up. Jesus filled up. But he didn't just fill up on all the things his flesh wanted. Yes, he enjoyed life. Yes, he had things he enjoyed doing that refreshed him, just like you and I have things we do that refresh us. But he also got filled up with the Spirit because he spent time talking to his Heavenly Father. And he did it consistently. So I want to give you a few things here that I think will help you when it comes to how to pray. You need to have a certain time that you pray. That time can change from one season to the next. The lifestyle stays, but the time can change. Have a certain time and then have a certain place that you pray. Jesus is always retreating. He's always going somewhere else. Why? Because he was surrounded by people. And when he retreated to pray, the only person he was concerned about was his heavenly father. So he had 
a certain time that he prayed, he had a certain place that he prayed, and then we need to have a certain plan when we pray. Listen, God wants to hear everything on your heart, and maybe I'm only preaching to me, but if I'm not careful, I can fill my prayers with all the thoughts in my head, and if I'm not careful, I forget to pray about some of the things that I know matter to me and matter to God because life gets in the way. So let me tell you what I do. And let me tell you why I feel like I'm family at this church, even though this is the first time I've ever been at this church. Because for the last few years, every Sunday morning, before I get up on the stage at our church and hold a mic in my hand and preach a word to my congregation, I've already prayed for Pastor Q. I've already prayed for Hope City Church and for Waterloo, Iowa, because my thing is bigger than my thing. And your thing is bigger than your thing. And so I have a group of pastors and a group of churches that, that I've just committed part of my life to. Like we are in this thing for the long haul. Pastor Q can't get rid of me now if he tries. We are in this thing for life. And so I don't just wanna be praying about my thing. I gotta pray about some other things God is doing. So every Sunday, I pray for my pastor friends and the churches that God has called them to lead. Every Friday, I pray for my family. Every single Friday, I pray for all of my family, my kids, my extended family. I pray for my wife and for our marriage because I know the enemy would love nothing more than to distract and disrupt, disrupt what God has called us to. So I pray for it. So what would it look like if you just took some time next week to have something that you are praying for every single day of the week? I'm praying for them. I'm praying for that. This is what I'm gonna do. This is how I'm gonna pray. Prayer should be a proactive part of our daily life, not just a reactive response to tragedy in our life. Listen, y'all. When we're in crisis, we all pray. But if that's the only time we pray, Come on, somebody. I said, if that's the only time we pray, then we are missing the heartbeat of God who says he wants a relationship with us and we ought to give him at least five minutes of every day to have a conversation with him. Not just when we're in the middle of chaos and tragedy. One of the best things I think we can learn to do is to pray first. In Philippians 4, 6, the apostle Paul says, don't worry about anything. Say anything. Instead, pray about everything. Come on, say everything. everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Boy, I'm really good at that first part. Tell God what you need. Anybody got a pretty big list? If you're being honest, anybody feel like that list is sometimes looks like your Christmas letter when you were a kid writing to Santa Claus? Yeah, because it's not just the need, right? It's the want. God, I want. God, I want. God, I want. God wants to know what you want. He wants to know what you need. He already knows it, but he likes to hear us say it. I'm good at that part. A lot of us are good at that part. You know what I'm not so good at? The other part that Paul says, tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Sometimes my conversation with God is only about what I need him to do and I fail to approach the throne with a grateful heart for what he's already done because I'm still here, I'm still breathing and he's not done working on my life. He's brought me through everything he's brought me through and, and I'm connected to a greater purpose. So when to pray? What about before the day begins? What about before the day ends? You gotta know how you're wired. You gotta know how you flow. What about before you go to work or school? Because we all know when you go to work or school, something's gonna happen. And you're gonna need Jesus when it happens. Here's a good one. How about before you send that text? Let me add one that's not even on the screen. Before you make that post on Facebook for the love of the Lord, <laughs> pray before you put that post on Facebook. Before you react, how about before bad things happen? How about before you eat, drive, or travel? After this service, Pastor Q and I are gonna go eat and then drive back to the airport. And then I'm gonna get on a plane, I'm gonna travel home. In, in church world, we have a phrase that covers all three of these things. We call them traveling mercies. Y'all ever heard that? I grew up hearing that as a kid. I had no idea what it meant. All I could picture in my mind was that there was an angel carrying our car and there was an angel carrying the plane. And you know what? I thought, that's cool. It's better with an angel than without an angel, so I'll take it. <laughs> Truth is, 
when to pray is any time. It's always a good time to pray, but the best time to pray is always before you think you need it because how many of you know you're gonna need it? You're just gonna need it. I'm gonna need it, you're gonna need it. We, we don't even always know what we're gonna need, but we know that we're gonna need it. And guess who does know what we need? Our Heavenly Father. So we ask him to meet and supply all that we need and give us all the wisdom for every conversation and every text and every moment and every situation and every obstacle before we even ever get there because when we pray it in advance, he goes before us, come on, we serve a faithful God and his Holy Spirit empowers us. And so we are more than enough. There are a lot of different types of prayer. When, when, when y'all got that prayer book to start this series, there's different types of prayers. Biblical prayers, historical prayers that followers of Jesus have prayed, different types of prayers. But when I'm, I'm thinking about what to pray, the place I always start is the way that Jesus taught his disciples and his followers to pray. Because how many of you know when Jesus talks, we should probably be listening? And so Jesus is preaching one of his most famous sermons ever. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. And he's got believers and followers, and he's got skeptics and cynics, and he's got people who believe in God but don't believe in him. There are actually a lot of people Jesus is talking to that knew about God, but they didn't really know God. This is one of the biggest faces, I think, facing the American church today is that we have a lot of people that know about God, but we don't actually know God. Our lives don't reflect God. And so Jesus knows this is his audience, and he knows that he's surrounded by people who have heard all these really smart, highly educated, intellectual people pray these big prayers with words they don't understand. And it's left a lot of people feeling insecure. It's left a lot of people feeling inadequate. It's left a lot of people more focused on religion than relationship. God is not interested in religion. He never has been interested in religion. He wants your heart and your life. And he he doesn't want all these things from us. He wants them for us because they are for our good. They are for our benefit. And so Jesus is teaching and he's preaching and the question is asked, how should we pray? Jesus says, let me tell you how to pray. The first thing he says is fascinating. He says, you should go to a quiet place and you should pray in private instead of praying in public. Now, Jesus doesn't mean don't ever pray in public. Jesus prays in public. But again, the audience matters because there's all these people that think the pinnacle of knowing God is standing on a stage like this with a microphone and praying in public and impressing people with their words. Jesus says, don't don't be focused on that. Don't be focused on that because can I tell you something? My best growth as a follower of Jesus does not happen when I'm on the stage with this microphone. It happens when I'm in my quiet place spending time with my heavenly father when nobody else sees what I'm doing and what I'm praying and what I'm saying and thinking. And that's why Jesus says, go to a quiet place. And then he says, don't use big words, keep it simple. And so he shows them. And in Matthew 6, starting with verse 9, he says, pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And everybody said, amen. This is what we call the Lord's Prayer. Many of you have heard it. Even if you're on the outside looking in at church this morning, not sure what you think about God, not sure what you think about this place called Hope City, you've heard this prayer. And in this prayer, I think Jesus is helping show us not just how to pray, but what to pray. Like in verse nine, when he says, our Father in heaven, what's he saying? Connect with God relationally. That's what to pray, our Father. We, we have a Father and he's a good Father. And despite 
the realities and the hardships many of us have had with earthly fathers, fathers that weren't there and didn't show up. And it's left that fatherhood wound in our life. Jesus is reminding us that we have a father in heaven and he wants good for us. And so when I pray, I'm connecting with God relationally. And then I'm worshiping God reverently. Hallowed be your name, the text says. Like, don't forget, as much as God is our heavenly father and he wants to connect with us relationally, oh, hallowed be your name. Oh, you are worthy, God. You, you, are, you are not my boy, you are not my bro, you are my heavenly father and you are great and greatly to be praised. Hallow would be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What are we doing when we say that? We're trusting God sovereignly. God, you are sovereign over all. You are in control, I am not. You know what's best, I do not, so I trust you sovereignly. And then we depend on God wholeheartedly. Give us this day our daily bread. God knows what we need, he knows what we want, and he is our provider. I don't just depend on God for some of the things, I depend on God for all of the things. Repent and forgive unashamedly. It says, and do not lead us into temptation, or, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. I love the first part, forgive us our debts, because that's talking about me. Yes, God, forgive me, I need forgiveness. But then Jesus has to drop in this and I gotta forgive you when you do something dumb to me. I don't like that part. Cause it's easier to stay angry and bitter church, but bitter doesn't make you better. And so Jesus says, hey, if you want forgiveness from God, just remember that part of that forgiveness is that you extend it to somebody else in your life that needs it. And maybe they don't deserve it either. And maybe they didn't earn it either. And maybe they didn't even ask for it, but you're gonna forgive them anyway so that your heart stays clear. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. This is rebuking the enemy with authority. When we pray, we have authority. Did you hear me, Hope City Church? When we pray, we have authority. Newsflash, when you're following Jesus, it is not a matter of if the enemy will attack. It's a matter of when he will attack. So guess what? I'm not gonna be surprised by the attack. I'm gonna rebuke the enemy with authority before the attack ever comes because I know he's prowling around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And I know he wants to turn the tables on my life and what God's doing in my heart. So I just pray, God, move me away from things that are gonna tempt me. The enemy has no place in my life and then honor God and his authority for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. I honor you, God, and I honor your authority and your dominion in this earth and in my life and in my heart, I honor you, God. Listen, if you hear nothing else that we talked about today, I want you to lean into this truth because I believe if you'll just lean into this, just this one thing, that God can use it to change and transform your entire life. And that one thing is this, the heart of Jesus is that prayer would be our first response, not our last resort. Prayer needs to be our first response, not our last resort. That's how we pray without ceasing. That's how prayer becomes as close to our lips as the next breath we take. We are in tune and in step with the Spirit. So I really feel like there are, are some of us here today, some of us watching and listening right now, that we know our first response simply needs to be saying yes to Jesus. We are sinners in need of a savior, we know it. Maybe we've never said yes to Jesus and today's the day. Or maybe at one point we did say yes to Jesus, but we're, we're a prodigal son or daughter, we've run away. And, and today's the day we're coming home and we serve a God that heavenly father who's, who's ready to welcome us with open arms, receive us back to the family. So maybe that's you. Or maybe, maybe you're already following Jesus, but prayer is not your first response, it's a last resort. It's not a lifestyle, it's seasonal. You do it on Sundays, 
You do it 42 days out of the year when you're doing two different rounds of 21 days of prayer and fasting. And you want it so bad to be a lifestyle, but it's just been a season. And today's the day where that changes forever. This is the day God takes this season that we've been walking through and he turns it into a lifestyle. I believe God's word in James 4, 8, where it tells us that if we'll draw close to God, he'll draw close to us. But that requires us to take a step. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's not moved. We have to take a step towards him. And in taking that step towards him, he draws closer to us. And so I wanna give people in both groups a chance to respond this morning. First thing I wanna do is I wanna lead us in a prayer. We call this the sinner's prayer, the prayer of salvation, and it's exactly that. It's us saying yes to Jesus and acknowledging that we're sinners in need of a savior. And I, I'm gonna ask you to repeat this prayer out loud after me, all of us, even those of us that are already following Jesus. It's simply a way for us to confess what we already believe and know to be true, but the reason I wanna ask you to speak it out loud is because it's also a way to talk to the person that's around us, beside us, behind us, who might be saying yes to Jesus for the first time today or might be coming back to their faith. We're gonna pray this prayer together as a church family. And then after we pray that prayer, I'm gonna give those of you who are already following Jesus a chance to respond to this word and say, yes, I want prayer to be my first response, not a last resort. So would you bow your heads? Would you close your eyes? And loudly together as one, would you just repeat this prayer after me? Say, Jesus, I love you. I thank you for loving me. I thank you for believing in me when I didn't believe in myself. I ask forgiveness for my sin. I ask forgiveness for my mistakes. Come into my life, make me new. Do what only you can do. I give you everything I have. I give you everything I am. I give you everything I hope to be. I give you all of me today. In Jesus' name I pray. Now with all heads still bowed and all eyes still closed, let's honor this moment with reverence and sincerity. You're already following Jesus, but you would say, Pastor, that's me. Prayer has been a last resort, not a first response. Prayer has been a seasonal activity instead of a lifestyle. If that's you, and you wanna step in to that lifestyle of prayer, you wanna step in to making prayer your first response instead of a last resort, would you just raise your hand in your seat right now and say, that's me, thank you, thank you. God, my brothers and sisters in Christ have stepped out today. They've taken a step towards you. So we're just asking you to be true to your word that tells us when we step out, you will step in. When we draw close to you, you will draw close to us. God, I pray that you would do it. Continue to show up in our lives and in our hearts. Help us to figure out what it looks like to make prayer a lifestyle in our first response instead of a last resort. We trust you with it. It's in your name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Come on, can we put our hands together and give God praise? <laughs>